So Frank, yeah. as always, it's lovely to be at V. Well, welcome. We're glad you're here. In November in New York City, and we had a fabulous series of cluttered sessions yesterday, addressing a number of issues that remain unanswered uh, in carotid stenting. So my question to you is firstly, what do you think the future looks like for carotid artery stenting? Well, we, we recently wrote something about this that even though the trials have been a little bit discouraging for CAS or carotid stenting, I believe that the future looks bright for carotid stenting because there are a number of improvements or potential improvements that have got to be proven that are appearing on the scene that I think will improve the results for carotid stenting and make it more competitive with carotid endarterectomy and perhaps even with best medical treatment. And, and those improvements are uh, better cerebral protection with reversal or cessation of flow, um, better stents, particularly the membrane covered and the mesh covered stents which are in trials, um, and a number of other better selection of patients and things like that. So all three of these things I think will improve the results of carotid stenting and uh, make the older trials which were unfavorable obsolete. So we need more trials to prove that these things work. So um, my first question then is do you think that trials are always just a snapshot in time and is, if so how do you trial effectively uh, a technology that is in rapid evolution. Uh, and to be fair, carotid stenting has been put on the back burner in terms of evolution. Oh yes, oh, it, well, well there's no question. Carotid stenting is in decline vis-a-vis uh, -vis carotid endarterectomy for symptomatic carotid stenosis. And for asymptomatic, carotid stenting is losing out to best medical treatment, as well as perhaps carotid endarterectomy. But you've got to have the trials to document the efficacy of the three or the two things that I mentioned. I forgot to mention a very important third thing is access to the carotid via the neck, which will uh, avoid all the uh, embolic events that are produced by traversing the arch or tortuous vessels. So I think the, the better stents, um, better embolic protection with reversal of flow, and access through the neck are the three biggies, but they have, we have to have trials of some sort or evidence of some sort to prove that these potential advantages really are advantageous, and I think that will happen. And we're going to be discussing that in depth, I think, in Friday's carotid yes, sessions. Yes, in fri Friday we're talking a lot about the currently existing suggestions or suggestive evidence that these are beneficial, but we have to... Uh, we have to get more evidence, and I don't think we'll get it all this year, but I think it'll be very provocative. So obviously, you know, you mentioned the membrane mesh stents, mm -hmm. and there are three companies in that space right, I know working that. on membrane mesh technologies, and it makes good logical sense to have a better scaffold, a scaffolding device that can brace back rival plaque, and maybe address that uh, stroke risk that we know is at its peak between day zero and day 30, actually it's a day zero stroke rate. Absolutely. Uh, but my concern is when carotid stenting has actually proven itself as an effective deterrent mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. ipsilateral ischemic stroke in the longer term beyond 30 days, my concern is that we don't have yet longer term data on the fate of the internal or the external when we put a membrane mesh stent in. So my, my, my worry is that we trade off that better 30-day stroke risk with membrane mesh okay. against an uncertain future when we'd already bought that future for ourselves with uh, Ben. That's a very good point. But so that's my slight concern. Th that is a concern, <clears throat> and that's why we need more trials. But some of our work years ago in a in vitro model showed that you could restore the lumen magnificently in a 99% carotid stenotic lesion and yet you saw these um, particles that were flimsily attached to the wall protruding through the stent and presumably with flow those get washed off and that's what causes the delayed stroke so yeah. that no protection device can protect against them. So I think the membrane and mesh covered stents are a big deal and uh, 
I would predict, although you can't predict, that's the problem. You can't predict with 100% accuracy, but I predict with reasonable accuracy that they're going to make a big difference. I hope so, and I do hope that the companies involved in their design and evaluation will follow the patients out longer term. I'm sure the FDA will, will we'll mandate, mandate that. Yeah. But, but I think we know that, as you pointed out, that the long-term results have not been the issue. It's the early results, what happens in the first at 30 days and after that everything the curves are always parallel but hopefully they'll be that way with the membrane and mesh covered stents. Now you did member, uh, mention alternative access and transcarotid and obviously um, you explained that that was an important step forward because we could avoid catheterizing the arch which we know is a hostile territory endovascular. Right. Often for me when I was training my fellows it was the rate limiting step for them. Of course. It took a long time you know Futzing about around the arch and trying to catheterize the great vessel origins. But also the transcarotid approach allows you to avoid another hostile territory that's surgically hostile, which is the carotid bifurcation in terms of the cranial nerve plexus right. there. So when they go in just above the clavicle for the transcarotid approach, there's basically just the tenth nerve and its recurrent branch that can get in the way. Yeah, but it, 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 that's the simplest of procedures. And, and so I think that, and probably, um, I'm, I'm asking you, I, I'm speculating, there'll pretty soon be a way of doing that whole thing uh, percutaneously. Well, um, you know, there's a trade-off there because to enable the very robust flow rates that we get with the right. flow reversal system, we have quite a large sheath, so it's okay. 10.5 French outer diameter, okay. so right now we have exquisite control of that through a mini incision, okay. and it's not like an endarterectomy incision. Uh, you know, we have procedural times from the IDE trial roadster which are less than half and our tract tri times skin to skin right. within the Crest trial. So it's a smaller incision, less involved. But right now it is an incision. It's largely done by vascular surgeons, but can be done like, for Anybody. example, in my case. Right. <laughs> no, I asked my vascular surgeons to do, do no, the cut train down. a monkey to do <laughs> surgery. <laughs> No, that's not what I meant. <laughs> no, I'm but, serious. But uh, yes, but right now, I mean, with the, we, we want to have that good control of the closure. Why, why do you need such a big sheath? Uh, it's basically to have a wide internal bore, low resistance tubing to get high flow rate flow reversal. Really robust. Oh, okay, so it's for the flow reversal, not yes. for flow, flow maintenance. Good. It's just okay. to get really robust. Uh, well, I, I think that's a very exciting technology, and I think the, the new stent designs are exciting, and uh, picking patients better, doing less cases that are unnecessary and stuff like that. I think the future is very bright for carotid stenting. So, you know, we're, we're sort of on the verge of Crest 2 and the Crest 2 companion registries starting off. Uh, that's obviously, there's going to be a time lag there, but in terms of recruitment, uh, completion of the trial. If we look at Crest 1, it took, I think, eight years, or right. something like that. Um, so, ha what do you predict the recruitment will look like for Crest 2? Do you I think, think there will be any excellent. problems with equipoise? No, I think it will be excellent. So, so you think that um, surgeons won't have a problem randomizing an asymptomatic patient who's had, let's say, stenosis progression over the past couple of years with a high, very high grade I, I, into the trial? My own belief <coughs> is that they should randomized because I think there is currently equipoise. I mean, I just don't know how to treat my asymptomatic patients. I, I've changed a little bit. I think some of them should be intervened upon, either by a stent or endarterectomy, because you can now, there's evidence appearing that you can pick out the uh, high-risk asymptomatic patient. I mean, the work of Nicolaides and some others has shown that in Spence that there are certain groups of, high, of asymptomatic patients that are at higher risk, and I think they probably should have a carotid endarterectomy or a stent, even though we don't know that for sure. But we don't know for sure whether symptomatic patients all should be treated interventionally. Well, we yes. think so, but the old trials, the classic landmark trials, are now obsolete because best medical therapy really has made a difference. It's not perfect, but it helps. So that's uh, the premise behind ECST2, right. Martin Burns uh, trial, which I'm fortunate enough to sit on in terms of the steering committee. Will that have an answer for the symptomatics? Uh, yes, but it's sort of the less, well, lesser degrees of yeah. symptom status, uh, symptomatic. I mean, e even NASA showed that if you didn't have a high-grade stenosis, 
that carotid endarterectomy didn't uh, confer any benefit. So I, I think the, the ones to look at are probably the lesser ones first. Yes. But we really don't know. And uh, I, I happen to be a great believer in statins. I think they're a miracle drug. And we had a session yesterday, or it was at the carotid session, where somebody spoke on, I mean, the New York Times thought that statins were dangerous. And, and they had two great experts, internists or cardiologists, who were citing the, the toxicity of statins. And the toxicity of statins are really quite minimal. They're, they're, uh, they way overstated it. And it got as an op-ed into the New York Times. And it was wrong. So talking about best medical therapy in statins, you know that Samparis uh, mm -hmm. didn't really achieve in terms of intracranial stenting, partly because the best medical therapy then was, was just so good. so good. Right, precisely. And but we don't know that that applies here. That's why it has to be yeah. repeated. Uh, but I think your prediction might be that best medical therapy in the current day form, if it could repeat what Sampras's best medical therapy limb looked like, might be very effective. I, I think it is very effective. And I think it's very effective in preventing heart attacks. Um, and, and, you know, we once talked about putting it in the water, and, and we've never <laughs> succeeded with yes, that. Yes, I remember that. But, but, again, the New York Times article cited the um, money-making tendencies of the drug companies and the doctors that were prescribing them, and they missed the boat entirely, uh, just to show you the bias of the New York Times. And I wrote a very nice letter to the editor of the New York Times refuting that op-ed, and it wasn't published, wasn't accepted. So. You can't believe everything you read. So just going back to Quest 2 briefly, do you think um, the physicians who recruit patients into that trial will start to use DW DWMRI of their patients to see whether they're slightly more worthy of an intervention or transcranial Doppler, as, as you mentioned with some of the papers? I don't know whether they will or not, but they should. I mean, there's no question that one of the risk factors that suggests a higher risk asymptomatic patient is if they've already had MRI or CT evidence of a silent stroke. And we know that silent strokes aren't always that silent. I mean, they do something. You need every brain cell you've got, supposedly. Well, actually, having said that, I watched on the flight here the film Lucy, where apparently we only use 10% of our cerebral cortex. Mm -hmm. So there's probably a lot of space, certainly in my head, I'm sure there's a lot of space unused, <laughs> but the bottom line is I want to keep what I have, <laughs> Me too. at least there. So in any event, we're going to have another, I, and you're speaking on it, another yes. very good carotid session on Friday, and I'm looking forward to that. But even that's not going to answer all the questions, you know. We'll, it's just setting things up so that everybody will come back next year and, and, and find more answers. I'll have a debate against Ross and he'll wipe the floor with me. What, what, what's your debate on? <laughs> Whether you can treat recently symptomatic patients oh. with carotid stents. Well, there's a very important point <laughs> apropos of that. If somebody's really good at what they do, a doctor, say at a hip replacement or open heart surgery or carotid stenting or carotid surgery, they can get better results than, the, than doctors as a whole the average guy in our audience. And I think, for example, what we heard this morning on some of the wonderful results with complex aneurysms, fixing the visceral segment endovascularly by various techniques. These guys are so good at it, they're the leaders in the world, and that doesn't mean that every person in that audience who's a trained surgeon or a trained endovascular specialist can replicate those results. So I, I think that you may be able to achieve really good results early on with carotid stenting in, in recently symptomatic patients, but maybe not everybody else will. And of course that, again, calls for more trials and more registry data and more analysis of population-based data. So there are lots of unknowns and there are lots of ways to look at it. Randomized trials are not the only answer. Um, you could win the debate. We'll, win the debate. we'll see. We'll see. But, you know, uh, in my mind, for a technique or a procedure to be adopted, it should be generalizable. So should be generalizable, the technique but, should but, be but, taken on board by a variety of different operators and done so safely. Yes, you're right. But there's no question that there are artists 
in, in doctoring, whether you're an endovascular specialist or a surgeon, there are people that can do things that the average surgeon can't. And, and that's been true since time immemorial. I mean, it's like the star baseball player who can play second base for the Yankees and is better than anybody else. And I think that's true in, in uh, endovascular therapy, and I think it's true in surgery. There, there are stars. They're really good guys. And it, it, whether it's due to their intrinsic ability or their commitment, they get very, or their experience. They can have a wealth of experience, and uh, they get very good. And that's why in our system, I think that not every doctor, though he may be qualified and certified, is going to be equivalent. And if you're having somebody in your family taken care of, you want to go to the best person that you can find. Well, you're certainly one of those stars, Frank. Well, I don't know about that anymore, but the, the fact is that, that something people should keep in mind, and when, uh, for, for, from a patient point of view, there should be some mechanism for primary doctors advising patients on how to get to the really good institution or specialist, and I don't think we have that in our system. No. And it's certainly not compensated for by present health care. But not all doctors are equal, not all interventionists, not all surgeons, not all, all orthopedic or heart surgeons, they're not all the same. And you want to go to somebody that's really good. And that's not easy to find sometimes. Agreed. Well, the, the concluding comment would be that we'll, we'll get a great deal of insight into the current state of the art, what's known and what's not known, from this year's meeting, but hopefully there'll be new stuff from you and from others that will get on next year's program and provide more insight, although uh, final answers will never, never be uh, forthcoming. So our meeting will hopefully go on for a long time. I hope so. Thank you very much.